I've never, ever, ever followed mimes before. Hi, everybody. Thank you. And, and if you got to get up and go uh, do something, please feel free. I guess we've changed plans because we were a little behind. Larry, thanks for inviting me uh, today, and thanks all of you for being here. I thought I'd um, uh, just be brief at the outset uh, and then take whatever questions or whatever criticisms that, y that you have. I, I think there are a lot of Coloradans here. I know there are people from other places as well. I, um, you, you cannot hurt my feelings is what I want you to know. I was an urban school superintendent for almost four years of my life. It has been beaten out of me a long, long time ago. And I, for one, think that, the, that we need to do better with the political conversation that we're having in this country if, if, if it's actually going to be worthy of the aspirations that we have with our kids and our grandkids. So um, think about candid stuff that you want to talk about. I've been in this job for five years. I was, had never run for office before I, I was appointed initially to the job and then ran uh, for the Senate. And, uh, and there are lots of things that concern the people that I represent in a state that's a third Democratic, a third Independent, and a third Republican. And most of those concerns are actually shared concerns. Uh, they're not different. Um, but the overarching concern is people figuring out how to navigate through an economy that no longer does what it used to do. You know, it, it, for the history of the country, when we had GDP growth, we had job growth and we had wage growth. That wasn't true in the last period of economic growth and until there's maybe some signs that we're seeing a tick up in median family income, but so far it hasn't been true in this recovery. And there are a lot of reasons for that. If you, if you, I didn't bring my slide today, but if I had it, what you'd see is GDP growing like this, dropping during the worst recession since the Great Depression, and then back up to be beyond where it was before we went into this recession. You'd see median family income skittering along at the bottom of the chart like this, declining, producing the worst income inequality that we've had in this country since 1928. You'd see jobs sort of like this. And in the middle, midst of all of it is the productivity index, which from the early 90s until today, has gone like this until we went into the recession and then it went just like this because firms were trying to figure out how to get through understandably with fewer people and we have become incredibly productive incredibly efficient because of our use of technology because of our response to China and India and the rest of the world um, and uh, and we're not creating jobs the way we used to and we're not creating the kind of wages we need to see I think there's a bunch of stuff we could do to help with this around infrastructure and immigration uh, and energy. But to, to me, the two most important solutions are education. We need to prepare our people for the 21st century, which we are not now doing. You live in a country, if you live in this country, where if you're born into poverty, your chances of getting a college degree and the, or the equivalent of a college degree are not 50-50, but 9 in 100 which means that if we don't change the way we deliver K-12, we don't change issues around access to higher education, we're not going to recognize ourselves in the middle of the 20th century if we're going to constrain 91 out of 100 poor children to the margins of the economy, the margins of the democracy at the outset. And the other is innovation, because it's companies that are created next week and the week after that and the week after that that are actually creating jobs at decent wages. The legacy firms are the ones that have become so productive. And that's what they should do. I mean, I'm not criticizing them. It's a natural life cycle of, of, of companies. So why should we all care about this? Well, you guys are watching this left-right drama on the television at night <clears throat> on whatever cable channel you watch with people screaming at each other or vociferously agreeing that everybody else is an idiot. Uh, or the stuff that's going on the floor. And I guess that my, what I would say, leave you with, and I'm almost done, is that I think this left-right discussion is largely, uh, uh, at least in the Congress, uh, a bunch of special interests that are masquerading as a, two political parties. And the axis that we really are on is a future versus past axis. The occupiers of the, of the past understand that really well, and they're really well organized to hold on to it. But the innovators and the people that are thinking about the future, not so much. David Brooks, who's a New York Times columnist, uh, had a column in a slightly different context a few months ago where he observed that the future has no lobby in Washington, D.C. And I believe that is exactly, that is precisely the issue. 
If we organize our thoughts around the next generation, if we organize our thoughts around what's coming ahead of us, instead of what we were doing deep in the middle of the 20th century, we're going to be fine. And we're going to find out there's a lot that we can agree on when it comes to the issues that I mentioned earlier. Let me give you one example of where we've done something, actually done something on, in this, because I think it's useful, and then I will stop. And when we get into questions, stuff, don't feel constrained to ask about stuff I talked about. I'm glad to talk about whatever it is is on your mind. But uh, th three or four years ago, I guess it was 2011, I've lost track of time, four years ago, the bioscience community in Colorado came to me and said, Michael, we are having a horrendous, first they said, you know what, we have 400 companies in this state that pay an average salary of $71,000 which caught my attention because that's the opposite of seeing median family income go down. And they came to me and they said, Michael, we can't raise venture capital here anymore. It's all going to Europe. It's all going to Asia because of regulatory uncertainty at the FDA. Is there anything you can do to help with that? I'm on the relevant committee. And I went to work with a colleague named Richard Burr, who's a Republican from North Carolina. And we were doing the FDA reauthorization. There are a bunch of things that we worked on. But one of the things we created was this whole new pathway for drugs in this country called breakthrough therapies. And essentially what this, you, there are people in this audience who know a lot more about this than I do, but essentially what it allows the FDA to do is apply 21st century science and if we're seeing drugs that are having a huge impact in a small population of patients, that they can approve it for those patients as we figure out what we're doing with respect to everybody else. In two years, there have been 178 applications for breakthrough therapy designation. There are fo over 40, I think 44 drugs, just in two years, that are now in this pipe. It's shocking. I mean, the estimate was that by now there'd be two. There are 44 drugs in the pipeline, six of which have been approved by the FDA, including cystic fibrosis drugs, leukemia drugs, and not beca only because of breakthrough therapy. I'm not claiming that at all, but in part because of it. What you see from the national numbers is increases in venture capital and bioscience here in this country. Today in Colorado, three years later, a lot of this has to do with coming out of a recession. Instead of 400 companies, we now have 600 companies. And instead of paying an average salary of $74,000, they pay an average salary of $84,000. That's good. We need a lot more of that. And if we could get our heads wrapped around some things that we could do with respect to immigration, with respect to infrastructure with respect to energy, as I mentioned earlier, we would see that line begin to lift again in this country. And we'd once again be assured, which we are not today, assured that we have done our job as Americans, which is to provide more opportunity, not less, to the people that are coming after us. That is at risk, and that is the abiding concern of the people I represent, no matter what party they're in. So with that, I will stop and see what you Folks want to talk about, I'm going to try to go boy, girl, boy, girl, or girl, boy, girl, boy. And I have three boys with their hands up, so we're going to, five, six. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Bennett. I heard your presentation down at Fort Logan some years ago, and it was a great presentation. My question today is, is it a matter of patriotism for us to be innovative and hold our biotech companies and whatnot accountable and moving into the future? Because it's a huge multi-billion dollar business, as you know, and, and, and with all the you know, 60 minutes segments and pieces about corruption on Capitol Hill and, and Big Pharma. I mean, what's it really going to take to get us back in the forefront of, of moving ahead? And, and in terms care? of? Well, and pharmaceutical development, biotechnology, huh. as, as, well, as I think, Professor I mean, Goldlab here. Yeah. I think we need to make sure that we've got a tax regime that is one that, um, uh, that, that Inspire, that inspires innovation and, and that we, people have the ability to either build their companies or make exits that are not, not just getting acquired by large companies who are, you know, increasingly doing less research and more of just picking you off. Um, what, you can't, there's a limit obviously to what the government can do about any of that, but I think we can make sure that the that the, Im that the incumbent actors are not advantaged just because they're incumbent actors. And that doesn't just go for bioscience. That's equally true for energy as well. My daughters are not going to be happy with me. Yes, sir. Thank you for 
in line with the thoughts of how to make the process even better, um, information disparity has reversed once we needed the FDA to know anything about drugs. Now there's a widespread ability of physicians, even patients, to know a lot about drugs. Um, so the, regular, the FDA can facilitate that. And um, one proposal that may help with what was just asked, how do we move forward, if the FDA, like most things that rate, provide, let's say, a numerical rating from 1 to 99 regarding acute safety and chronic safety, acute benefit and chronic benefit, and let patients and doctors, doctors now have more information than the FDA because they can have personalized information. The FDA can never have that. And allow them with expert rating scales to make more decisions. So I'm asking whether we can get more information out of the FDA and put more decision power in doctors and I, patients. I am, I am not um, the commissioner of the FDA, uh, which is a good thing for everybody. Peggy Hamburg is, and she's doing a very good job, I think, uh, an exceptional job. I think your question is, or your observation is just an excellent one. And, and directionally, that's where I, I think we need to go. But let me use it to jump off and say, having now been in the federal government for five years, um, I really am concerned about a complete lack of synchronicity between the speed at which the federal government operates and the knowledge that's contained within it and the, what's happening in the rest of the world. There is no synchronicity. And when you look at fairly elemental things, I mean, <clears throat> I've been in the private sector too, but I've worked at every level of government. And I think on, in the wake of the rollout of health I'm not talking about the implementation, I'm talking about the actual rollout of the website. I think we, one can confess, government is terrible at IT, it's terrible at procurement, and it's terrible at customer service. And, but there, and, and we don't have a theory for figuring that out. And the point that you're making can apply to all kinds of fields of expertise where there's a, there's a the, the quality of information and the quality of, of the sort of the, the best in, in class is outside of the government. The question is, and I think that the answer is, we're not going to be able to make changes in a command and control kind of way that are going to be effective all the way across the board. But if we can figure out ways of running pilots at the FDA that would do exactly what you're talking about so we can learn from them and build on that success, um, that, was the, that was the Machiavellian notion behind breakthrough therapies to begin with. Yeah, I mean, you can jump up and down, not you, I can jump up and down and say, who is it at the FDA that's in charge of figuring out how to keep a bioscience industry here in the United States? Or who is it at the FDA who's actually supporting innovation? Or, you know, try to pass a piece of legislation that says you should support innovation. What we decided to do was take a category and see if we could learn from it. And the reality is now, the reason there have been 178 requests, and the reason the FDA, I hear this from drug companies, you know, the, the guys that are asking the request, that people at the FDA who are interested in innovation are pushing people to this and saying, have you thought about this designation? Have you, that's my dream come true. And the question then is, how do you spread that across the agency? And I think your suggestion, I'd love to talk to you more about that. I think it's a very interesting and good one. Yes, ma'am. But what about if we look wider? You've got a room full of people that are doing innovations in diagnostics, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, and we still run up against the insurance companies, the payers, the reimbursement. How do we get that to the good people of the state of Colorado and the rest of the country? So we've been working with a bunch of folks on the, on the issue around diagnostics for, for the reason that you describe, and it's a very good example of the rapid pace that we're, we're heading in and, 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 and the lack of, you know, the, the sort of the worry that I described earlier. I'm just repeating myself, which I don't want to do. But I, I, I will say that when it comes to health care, as policymakers, and this may sound strange from somebody who voted for the health care bill, but we need to have some humility here about uh, what the future holds because we don't know. We have no idea 
where we're going to be 20 years from now in terms of healthcare in this country because of the technological revolution that's happening. You know, and 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we didn't even have the computing power to, to, to do what's, what's happening now. It's incredible. I'll give you another example of how far behind we are. I was out at Apple, and I know people here may say, well, they're not the most innovative company in the world, but I was out there to learn what they're doing on K-12 education. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. They had a slide that showed that of their last 12 months of revenue, 75% of it was derived from stuff they didn't even sell five years before. Okay? So it is amazing. 75% they didn't even sell it five years before, yet we haven't updated the tax code in this country since 1984. What are the chances that code reflects what's actually going on in, the, in this economy? Or is, or is allowing us in a, you know, to, to have the most competitive environment that we can possibly have? I was in college in 1984. I'll come here and I'll come back to you quickly. Yeah, so my question is around Ballet May and the way that we uh, finance college educations in this country. We basically have these kids held as chattel for 10 to 20 years, maybe 30 years of their careers. The way Sally May operates, it's not just the interest rate, it's the fees, it's the way they report. It's not transparent, and these kids, unless they have a PhD in finance, have almost no chance to get out from under the burden. How can we solve that mess? Yeah. Um, I agree with you that, it, yeah, it is a mess. It, it, it is a mess, and, uh, and when George, Bo and it has a real effect. The most painful thing that I have heard when I've been out in, in uh, doing town halls and I've heard it a couple of times. I've heard many versions of it many times, but a couple of times I've heard exactly this. We cannot afford to send our kid to the best college they got into. That's a disgrace. It's just, that is a disgrace. A kid should be able to go to the best college they got into. And there are a lot of countries around the world that are making it easier for that to happen, not harder. We're making it harder, both because of the cost of higher ed is going up and because the, the financing's all screwed up, and I am working with Lamar Alexander, who's a Republican from Tennessee, who used to be the Secretary of Education in George Bush 1's uh, uh, administration on this issue, and I will report back to you. I'll tell you one thing on the front end, which is that we, one of the things we're trying to do is create a world in which students no longer have to fill out what's called the FAFSA form, which is a form that exists <laughs> And, what, and that could be answered with two questions instead of, as in, what is your income and how big is your family? Instead of asking you whether you got clergy income last year, which is on that form, there's a lot of work that has to be done here. And look, this is a very serious problem because when George Bush, the, the son, the son was elected president, not a partisan, this is a temporal observation. When the son was elected president, we led the world in the production of college graduates. We are today 16th in the world. You know, that's in a decade. And you can have a debate about whether, well, is the quality of the degree as good? Is it, you know, we're, we're moving in the wrong direction, not in the right direction when it comes to, when it comes to higher ed and K-12. Yes, ma'am. Senator Burr has provided a lot of leadership on veterans issues. Um, um, are, are you working on any of the veterans' issues around PTSD? There's a long wait for care for, care for the returning veterans with I, brain disease. I strongly urge everybody in this room to go out this weekend and buy the following book. And if I thought it was a waste of money, I wouldn't tell you that. It's called Thank You for Your Service. Have you, do you have it? it oh, did you? I, I had the author come to my office after I finished this book. It is a shattering shattering description of what we are not doing for our veterans that are coming back with traumatic brain injuries and PTSD. And we're not, we are not. I, and, and, I, and, I, and it is something we've spent the last five years working hard on. The charge that I have given to our veterans roundtable has been, what is it that we are actually going to do so that two years from now or five years from now, you pick the time that we're not back here having exactly the same conversation that we're having today. These guys go, you know, you meet these guys that have been you know, in either, either the current wars or the Vietnam War, you know, who walk around with a stack of paper that's this high that their correspondence with the VA 
FDA over a 30 year period who just simply can't get an answer to their question. Another systems problem, by the way, in a lot of ways, because of, because of the IT issue that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we, I also have a bill that would create an, a ch congressionally chartered veterans foundation like the National Parks Foundation. It would be a way to give the private sector a place to donate money on, that would then be used to create plant, this is going to sound really boring, but it's really important, to create planning grants for local communities who want to network the care for veterans better. You know, it reminds me so much of when I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. There was no shortage of people that wanted to help our kids, but everybody was falling all over each other. We weren't organized to receive the help. They weren't organized to give the help. There are great examples in El Paso County of the kind of network that we'd like to see all across our state. That's what we're trying to build here in Colorado. We'd like to make this the best place in America to be a veteran. Uh, and there's a great example in Montrose, Colorado as well. Uh, but we need to do a lot more. And, and I'm telling you, you should read this book. And the reason you should read it is if you ever feel like you're having a bad day, or if you ever feel like you somehow got the short end of the stick, you ought to read about these guys that were fighting, in, the, in this case, in a war that we should never have been fighting to begin with, and what we're doing, not doing for them now that they're back here. And you know, the st I've actually been thinking about reading it on the floor. I gave it to Harry Reid, and he read it, because when you read it, you say to yourself, how can these people spend their time on the floor making stuff up that's just totally untrue, instead of actually working to actually get something done for these guys? Forget the rest of it, at least for our veterans. Yes, sir. That's all right. Okay, this is uh, probably not going to be a very popular question with some of the people here. Our current system of developing medications involves venture capital, people putting money in to see where do they think they can make the most money. That's the way it works. You invest money, you hope to make a lot of money, which of course means that at the end, when they develop a product, it's going to be expensive and a lot of people can't afford it, which is a problem. You know, they make some minor uh, uh, things. They also find you're not going to find medications being developed for conditions where they're not going to make a lot of money. Things in primary care are just not going to, it's just not going to develop. It's not cost effective. That's the business model. God bless America. Capitalism does work, but doesn't work for everything. Now, also, they also get various tax breaks, which means they're, they're really being subsidized by the federal government anyway. We, we all got to acknowledge that. But then the, the question is then, how do we get, or why can't we just simply have the federal government doing research and then having these patents be in the public domain so to let every bloody uh, invention that comes out comes out as a generic. And then suddenly, people can afford to take the medication. They can have the cutting edge medications. I mean, it also is going to ultimately save the federal government money too because guess who pays for those drugs? Medicare. Who's paying for, who's, and, and, the, and TRICARE and the, and, federal, and, the, and the Department of Defense. That's where the money's coming from. Well then, why not just be spend the money, develop it, and then let the Defense Department, Medicare, said can buy the drugs at generic prices. We can everybody can developing it. Everybody could be making it. The and the other thing is, what the heck is the story about? Medicare cannot negotiate. They want to buy drugs. Oh no 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 no! You have to pay what the manufacturer wants. That's the thing. God forbid we should take advantage of our large purchases. What the heck's going on with this? So how can we handle this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I hadn't thought about the first yet, and I'm thinking about it as I, as I respond to you, and I, I don't want to shoot my mouth off about it, but I, but I do think there are, there's obviously huge, well, I shouldn't say obviously, because it's not obvious to everybody, huge merit in direct investment you know, by the government in basic research and science. Um, that's come under a lot, and, and so l let me put the park the other idea about generics. We, you know, and there's also issues beyond the negotiation. Why can't Medicare negotiate? Why also is the United States the one that's subsidizing the rest of the world in terms of drug prices? There are a lot of questions about the economics of this that we need to sort through. But on the on the direct uh, research question, these budgets that the House of Representatives is passing, I don't know if you've been are passing. I mean, these are budgets that take our domestic discretionary spend 
down to 4% of our operating budget. Today, it's 17% of our operating budget. 17% is domestic, discretionary. That's everything. That's transportation, education, agriculture, basic research and science, NIH, all that is in that 17%. 18% is defense, 65% uh, is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt. They would take it to 4%. I wouldn't invest in a company that, that was spending 4% on its future. You know, I'd, I wouldn't do that. And we're not even, I mean, the stuff that I actually would deficit spend on, and I'm worried about the debt, is education and infrastructure. But, but you go to 4%, we're, we're, we're out of, we're saying we're closed, essentially, at that point. You know, so let me think about your first point, and uh, I agree with you on the second. I, I would like to, if possible, Senator, uh, we greatly appreciate your time, and we know it's limited. And at the same time, I think we need people to eat, yep. too. And, Senator, there's a microphone upstairs, and so if everyone could let you go straight up and we transition really quickly, that would be, I think, the ideal. And then we'll have you for as long as we have you. <laughs> 